Okay. Well, John, thanks for uh, coming back on No Way Out. You're our first repeat guest, and you were on episode number five. And a lot has happened since then. And a lot of the things that you uh, discuss frequently, um, particularly around the idea of the technologies that we use daily uh, being used as a means to uh, shift and alter our orientations. You know, where do you, where do you see us now from where you saw us at the beginning of the year when we spoke in January? Oh, wow. I'm not sure exactly what I said back then. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, the funny part is, is that most of the stuff I was talking about for the last three, four, five years, how AI would roll out and I mean, the way it would operate. And um, as opposed to the vision that AI would be human-like and, and um, ha you know, have a singular consciousness, uh, all, it's in, all of its impacts on society and everything else are pretty much in line with, with the early writing. So when it does actually happen, I'm like, okay, <laughs> uh, you, you know, it's not exciting anymore. It's not really worth writing about. And I let everyone else catch up <laughs> writing about it. Um, yeah, but... Uh, the AI space is developing pretty quick, and it's pretty much a dominant space because um, the large language models, this kind of meta construct that kind of condenses everything that we know and we talk about, we teach um, in terms of how we use the language. It's like built into the grammar and, and, and use of words um, is going to be the new interface, kind of the thing behind any kind of visual interface you have, it's going to be the, the driver. And big changes in computing and big changes in, in technology happen when the interface changes. So, you know, you go to GUI, changes, right? Um, which is a graphical user interface when we went to Windows. So, you know, we're going to see a lot of apps develop and built on top of that. And, and control of that really is the big battle. Um, that's going to be a huge battle. So who has control right now? Who, who, who do you see taking control? Well, I mean, based on what I saw with OpenAI when it was like talking to the Senate and the Senate, you know, completely clueless as to what was going on, you know, where they're, they had Sam Altman and they were like putting their hands on his shoulder saying, hey, guy, take care of us. <laughs> he said, I will take care of you. Just just keep on supporting me and I'll, I'll make sure it uh, doesn't go bad for us. But um, yeah, it's mostly corporate. The government's pretty much out of it. Um in part because the government doesn't have the data or access to the data is not allowed to legally to get the data that uh, uh, you know Facebook and and uh, OpenAI have had access to. I mean, if you talk well, to anyone at the senior in the NSA, they go, "Man, if I had anything like what Facebook had, it would have mm -hmm. been a different story." Um, so, uh, yeah, it's corporate, and uh, they're proceeding ahead because they, you know, if it can be built. It will be built. Uh, Google was ahead, and uh, they claim they're being, you know, so responsible, and that's slowing them down, and they're losing their edge, losing their lead, and they're dumbing down all their products when they do release them and gobbling them and, and and not pushing the boundaries of of what's possible. You've been talking about these patterns for years, and and one of the things, of course, with John Boyd. Yeah, we'll just continue here. So, uh, John, Mark was asking more about the. The you know the the connection back to the patterns that uh, Boyd was talking about, and you brought up large language models, and you know there's a yeah. there's some new new talk about uh, um, naturalistic approaches to artificial intelligence using what we know from neuroscience, and applying that towards AI uh, potential yep. dangers or opportunities with that. So uh, in this landscape right now, with large language models dominating things like ChatGPT, and I think it's called Bard. Uh, it, in your mind, uh, is there a next level of artificial intelligence that that's coming down to pike, or are we kind of stuck in this passive approach to building out these world models and then trying to use large language models to understand what's going on in the external environment? Right. So large language models are already going to multi mode, meaning that um, they're adding pictures and video. So you'll take a picture and say, ask the uh, the model, you know, what's going on here, right? And it will describe what's going on. Um, and it could identify who's in it. And it could do all that stuff and, and uh, put it into text that then can be utilized within the, within the models. So um, you'll see more and more capabilities glommed onto the existing 
a large language model. A large language model makes it, I mean, it's, it's really the driver here because it allows you to do, do natural language processing mm -hmm. um, or, you know, program, natural language uh, programming. Um, and that just takes a lot of logic rather than you know, knowledge of a specific language, uh, you know, computer language. Yes. Um, okay. And uh, makes it accessible. So you can build amazing things using that, you know, natural language programming and um, or prompting, um, and that uh, it's also accessible by the the lay user. Uh, then you'll start adding. Uh, then we'll see quickly see uh, uh, audio interactions mm -hmm. radically improve, right? Um, and so you'll have two way discourse added onto the system, um, and then uh, augmented reality, which is going to kind of complete the loop. So, um, you know, Apple's VR stuff was just, you know, first foray into it. Uh, it's, you know, it looks like AR, but it's actually VR, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, that'll allow uh, complete manipulation of the, the visual environment. And, uh, yeah, so we're going to see these things just get bigger and bigger and glommed on and multimodal and um, become the computing platform of choice for almost everything we're doing in it's uh, it makes a lot yeah. of sense. Uh, you know, even these uh, even neural networks and AI are going to make it into the you know basic core processes that we see uh, in 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 basic graphics work or basic uh, work that was typically done by the CPU. So uh, you know, you'll see AI cores in the in the uh, the, the the CPU. We'll see AI cores in the, we're already seeing the AI cores in the uh, uh, graphics processors, and uh, that's a radical speed increase where you know. A fraction of the energy, tiny, tiny fraction, like a one one thousandth, yeah, of the energy yeah. used for the same function. So you're, you're so, talking uh, about yeah. the process. If we're looking at processing is one aspect of this, and the other aspect would be, I know a lot of people are thinking about what type of jobs are going to be lost or created in this. And, and from my experience, you know, I, I learned Fortran seventy seven back in the day. Learned a little bit yeah, about C plus. You know, I didn't I didn't do a lot of programming in my life. Have coached a lot of programmers on in the agile space. And what we're seeing now is an impact where one programmer, one, one software developer has the ability to do maybe 3x to 10x what they were doing in the past with, uh, with access to through our LLMs, if you will. Right. Is, is that what you're seeing as well? Or is, is there a bigger factor in that? And then what impact does that have on, on jobs going forward um, in, in the uh, software space or the uh, technology space? Yeah, I'm not too worried about the software space. I mean, more okay. productive programmers. Um, mm -hmm. It's not a bad thing. I mean, the whole world could be could be uh, um, upgraded with software, and there's never a, a there's an endless demand or appetite for software that does stuff. Um, and the fact that it's making it easier, uh, you could you know, with certain types of AI functions, uh, you could if you're, that's incorporated into the product you're delivering it. I mean, it would take thousands of man hours to do exactly what that AI is doing. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. let alone the productivity of the programmer in actually getting things done. So software is not going to be a problem. Um, it'll start to be a problem in other areas, particularly in driving. Uh, hmm. You know, that's, it's, it, you know what, the autonomous AI uh, drivers right now are already better than, than uh, at least the Tesla one is already better than the standard driver. It's just not perfect yeah. yet. So, you know, there's complaints about it. You know, given that almost everybody driving a you know a fully upgraded Tesla uh, car is not driving at all anymore, yeah. they barely ever touch the steering wheel. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that it's not like resulting in mass death or an accident a week or something like that, where somebody's getting you know killed, is is a pretty strong indicator that the software works. Um, yeah. and, and then there's talk about you know, Elon building another super computing AI to to finalize it, go that last extra couple percent in terms of quality. So yeah, driving is and the uh, the biggest job category, right? You wipe that out, yeah. there's what, two and a half million people are going to be out of work. Oh, wow. Um, but that doesn't absolve anybody from looking around left and right when they cross a crosswalk, right? I mean, everybody's on their iPhone when they walk across a crosswalk now. Oh, so, the AI so will protect quite... them. No, no, th that's the whole thing. Okay. That, yeah, the wow. AI will be the the drivers are going to be protecting them. So, so we um, we can go around clueless. Then we can we can walk around with low situational awareness and be protected by AI. That's I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. 
John. Yeah, you know? I, well, <laughs> I, I think it's good. At, I mean, once once you do autonomous driving and it becomes safer than regular human being beings driving, uh, the insurance premiums are going to for driving yourself are going to go through the roof, right? And so, mm. yeah, and then it will make it like really expensive to drive yourself, and uh, then the fleet car systems will be really really inexpensive, and they'll be ubiquitous. Um, and um, on call all the time, everywhere. And so it's going to be like, why should I spend any money on a car when I can get one anytime I want within a you know a couple minutes? And yeah. I can do other stuff, and I don't have to worry about it. So once you go fleet cars, then you're then you don't have to build the you know four door sedan that everyone needs for the weekend, right? You don't need it for your commute, but you need it for the weekend. So then you can start going, okay, here's a single car or here single occupancy electric vehicle. We can fit, you know, five times as many on the road as we do with a you know standard car and it changes the whole dynamic in cities there's no parking in cities anymore uh yeah a lot of big changes big social changes if the, if if this thing is rolled out fast john, um john you but, talked to, yep. you talked about in uh your your one of your more recent global gorillas reports about the, how the academic body of knowledge is is getting consumed and absorbed completely by uh these models and that ai was outperforming TAs, um, you know, filing exams, writing exams. And I guess it goes back to what we always talk about, you know, John Boyd, people, ideas, and things. Now that we have this thing that's able to, right. uh, you know, to replicate our body of knowledge, what do you think that means for the human in, in going forward in their endeavors and their learning and education? Um, you know, is. Oh, I think, I think actually is a great thing. No, it's, it's an amazing thing, um, but it has a big danger. Um, associated with it is that okay so if we can model all of what a, an intelligent or educated human being is supposed to learn and what we think about things right now um, across all the variety of subjects possible um, even the specialty subjects if you add specialty data and, and, and information that's that's great so but it what it does imply though is that uh, we can create tutors we can we can leverage that information by creating teachers uh, that uh, interact with everybody at that level, right? And and like twenty four seven teachers, tutors that are always around and always helping you and always m making it possible for you to learn. Um, I mean, everything I've seen in in terms of uh, uh, educational value always tends to be skewed in, 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 in tutoring's favor. Tutoring is like much more effective than, than industrial classrooms. And so um, it's possible and, and, and it's really close. It's only like three, four, five years out, I think, it, before we start seeing uh, AI tutors that'll walk you through almost any topic all the time. You can attach it to a kid and they can talk to them and it will be a tutor for life. I mean, it, it, it's, it potentially everybody could have one. I mean, all over the world. In, in their natural language. And it's like, uh, you ever read, you've read a Diamond Age, right? With the young ladies uh, illustrated no. primer. Okay, no, so Diamond I'm Age not. is a, a, yes, it's a, it's a uh, science fiction book uh, from the early 2000s, I think. And uh, um, oh, who was the guy? Uh, Neil Stevenson. And so, uh, yeah, he, he wrote it. And um, it, it was about a world where you had, uh, you know, this there was this book that would teach people and they started distributing it but it wasn't you know it, it, it wasn't nearly as capable as our you know what we have available now because it didn't include a full-on ai so um imagine having a teacher for everybody a tutor that's like can bring top-notch stuff now the danger with this and the danger with all this ai and everything everything associated with it is that networks tend to centralize they tend to you know aggregate power um yeah uh there tends to only be one at the end of the day and uh that can be dominated um and uh there's a tendency in, in in current culture to use that level of domination to kind of control what people should think and what you know what should be approved knowledge and what's disapproved knowledge which is that long night you know, uh, narrow orthodoxy that I was worried about. So, so, so that's why, you know, I, I've taken an open source approach to a lot of so this. So more, more Tron for science fiction fans, right? With Tron frees and opens the system versus matrix matrix being that there's a, a, a centralization to the point where you're completely controlled. 
Yeah. I mean, it, if the, go- the corporations and the governments that have a hand in, in, in creating this tutor that rolls out on a global basis, uh, the ones in charge right now probably won't make it um, amenable to any type of religion. I mean, how would it incorporate religion? Would it even want to? Wouldn't want to. It, just, it would teach a set of values, and, and, and values are always you know, part of the educational experience. And the only way to ensure that there is like, you know, uh, a safety valve for civilization as a whole is that is, we use open source tools, open source AIs, and we build these things, uh, these, these tutors and other tools that we use on, those, on that open source base, which will allow a diversity of what we do. And it, this isn't something for, you know, some small group to do. It's like, it's going to take a lot of work to do these things correctly. So if you want an Islamic AI that's teaching kids, or you want a Christian AI that's teaching kids, or all the various denominations, if they're big enough, they can afford it, should be able to do hmm. it. Um, if you want a conservative one based on traditional values, if you want a, you know, one that's pro-U.S. and not U.S. was problematic. That's what I'm writing about now is the, the idea of undermining um, patriotism and nationalism uh, by destroying the tribal story. Uh, is um, Yeah, you should be able to have that outlet. But... You know, there's lots of great open source AIs out. There's large language models from uh, one came out of Meta, and there's others that are out there, and uh, they can run on your desktop. I mean, they don't have to. I mean, you should be able to get a cloud instance, but um, yeah, I mean, if we want some kind of, if we want a diversity, or true diversity, intellectual diversity, I mean, of, of ideas going forward and the ability to innovate, meaning take the outlier position and, and promote it. Right, the entrepreneurial approach. We're going to have to have that, you know, open source valve, because otherwise yeah. it's all going to be locked down. And it's a maximal. What people are pushing right now at the at the central level is a maximal rule set. Not a, you know, like the internet worked because it was a minimal rule set. You know, TCP/IP, IP everywhere. It's just like simple. Everybody got it. And what you wanted to do locally, it's up to you. Everything is higher in the stack. And um, you know what we're what we're seeing, at least nationally, is the attempt to have a maximal rule set imposed using technology. So that every, every everything everything so, uh, is yeah. boundaryed, everything is uh, rule laid in, everything is exactly as whoever's in charge wants it wants it to be. Right. Well, that body of knowledge is being pruned constantly. So yeah, they'll prune it at the origin, what data gets in, mm-hmm. input. And the takes that the AI has on the different historical elements, what's going on in the news, uh, you know, the values that are put in, all of that stuff, if done at centrally at the, at the globalist level right now, um, is probably something that most people wouldn't agree with. They wouldn't buy into. John, on a continuum uh, where we look at open source on one end and, and maybe more of a centralized approach on the other end, who would you place on, on the left end right now and who would you place on the right end? And, and I'll give you an example. Elon Musk, where does he fit in that continuum and the way he's thinking? Yeah, he's a, he's a little bit towards the open source side, um, but not nearly far enough. Uh, they, you know, I think he should have open sourced his, his AI work using Twitter as a basis and any kind of other data that he can get. Um, and give everybody that's participating in it, you know, share in the, in the upside. And, you know, we have the crypto that would make that possible very, very easily. Um, you know, it's like crypto was kind of like laying the, the railroad tracks, right? And, um, without a train <laughs> and AI is potentially the train that, uh, you know, needs to have that kind of railway, railway network to really shine is that. I'm willing to give data into an AI to make it better, work on it, making it better. Um, if I have some participation in the upside and hopefully that's there. Uh, open AI and those guys are all on the far left corporate side uh, okay. and, um, or whatever, I don't want to say even left, but they're on the corporate side. Um, yeah. Microsoft is kind of in the middle. They're just rolling out tools as fast as possible. They don't really care. Uh, <laughs> Google's probably at the farthest in terms of corporate control and restraint. Um, Meta, okay. uh, because they were behind, and they, they, their AI team uh, wasn't really too impressed with the tools that are out there now. They're not as human-like and, and conscious as they'd like them to be. 
which I think is mm-hmm. a main hope. Yeah, they open sourced their stuff. So Meta open sourced their AI. Okay. Um, so on this on this continuum, the the what I heard from you earlier is a potential threat to uh, tribalism, to uh, some of the the negative sides of things. It's going to be on the towards the side of the spectrum or continuum that is more of a centralized approach, right? Is that what I'm hearing? I, I think the long term threat to civilization is a centralized approach, and the tendency is okay. uh, that that people will say mm-hmm. um, things are so disordered, right? Uh, we we face so many dangers from the perma crisis, both political perma crisis, the the uh, you know environmental to the pandemic resurgence, all that other stuff, uh, that we're going to have to have a centralized approach. We're going to have to control this and that control values. And you know the difference between an AI uh, moderating conversations at a national scale or global scale uh, versus a you know a team of people to do it. It's like you know imagine all those uh, you know censorship organizations and you know. Stalin's Russia and uh, Stasi in East Germany, and they would have you know rooms full of bureaucrats, just to just to look at a tiny fraction of of the conversations and things people were doing, and watch mm-hmm. what they're doing, and make sense of what they're doing in photos, make sense of what they're saying, uh, redirect them, reeducate them, uh, you know, punish them, all you know without you know much tweaking. Well, once it's out there, it, it trained up to a sufficient level, it could do it. Um, and there's no way you're going to get around it if that's the core tool. So I can see why people will want it because they want to say, I want it. I don't want as much chaos um, as mm-hmm. there is. Or, there, you know, it, um, but, it, you know, it, I have no problem with people disagreeing. So, you know, it's like, okay, some set, that, some that, set disagrees. Isn't that no often problem. how a dictator or a tyrant but comes okay. to power? Is that people are just fed up and they want to have, uh, they want to have the chaos go away, or they want to, they, they'll accept a, a, a Franco or a Hitler or whoever because they just think, well, somebody's in charge and finally getting stuff done or whatever, and then all the things that come with it, you don't really pay attention to or you don't really realize until it's too late. Yeah, that's the classic Napoleon, right? So after the terror. He comes into a, a, a riot in in Paris and, and deals with it with grape it's, shot. It's right? funny. It's I, a, I hear that a lot disorder. brought up lately that people really need to go back and look at the French Revolution because, you know, the French Revolution comes in and makes this sweeping change and everybody thinks everything's going to be better. And then the people that make the sweeping change, they can't get along. They can't agree. And then the people that started it get their heads left off. And then, as you say, a Napoleon emerges and Europe is subjugated to a tyranny in a, in a, in a war, a war, you know, decade or so until, uh, un, until Waterloo. Um, do you, do you see, you know, now that the, the medium has changed, right. But the, but the patterns are still there. I mean, do you, do you envision things like that to, to occur? Yeah. I mean, this is like more patterns now than ever and more complex patterns now than ever. And, um, so the patterns approach is really the only way to even look at this. I mean, the difference between somebody who 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 looks at technology and makes predictions and and based on you know what's possible with the technological development um, between them and somebody who's good is the, that the 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 person that's good actually looks at all the social elements and how it interacts with everything and this you know the economic demand and and and. Uh, that would be driving it, the the uh, social pushback that would occur, the social uh, goodness that would zoom because of its introduction. So you have to look at that wider thing. Well, I, um, I was saying, you know, sticking on what that, was the original question because I sidetracked uh, myself. Yeah, narrative that a, that a tyranny can emerge amidst people saying that, look, I, I'm going to turn a blind right. eye to whatever they're doing behind the scenes, but you know, the, the, the lights are back on or the money is worth something now or, or the economy is thriving. You know, when I was a kid in West Germany, the, 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 uh, we had a clean right. lady in our house and my mother asked her, how could this happen? And she says, well, you know, before Hitler, we were eating turnips. And then when, when Hitler came, we had oranges, which was something that we never had before, right? So people, people become seduced by these, uh, these tyrannies. It's a lot of like what we talked about the other day with, uh, with Michael Ashley around his book, Neuromind, is that, 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 that the, uh, I've heard Elon call it a mind virus or whatever, but people just become, as you say, seduced um, by these things. And then they, they give a pass to things that they otherwise would not give a pass to. It's you, you, we've, we've used with the Boyd words, you know, Schwerpunkt and uh, Auftrag and Fingerspitzengefühl. But the one that you've used before in your writing is uh, Gleich Schaltung, 
you know, may, maybe that's something to talk about and, and, and make people aware of about that. Uh, Cause that's kind of, that's how, that's how people get unified, right? Behind something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Unified alignment. Um, in a network world, that's like getting everyone to um, sign on to agreement with the common enemy. And so you, you in the common enemy list, you know, keeps on growing. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, eventually, the, I mean, the, the, the thing that happened in Germany as a, you know, kind of as a example of that using Gleichschaltung, a common enemy as a, you know, unified way of thinking um, as a way to kind of, you know, keep people in line is that you got to keep on increasing the, the degree of threat and the immediacy of the threat because people come become inert to it. They become, you know, desensitized to it. And so, and then number of threats grows and eventually you're at war with everybody and you're exterminating your own population and mass. It's like, it's a self-defeating, self-limiting method. And we're, we're certainly on it. I, you know, we went from anti-Trump to anti-Putin to Cold War with Russia. Let's go to, you know, start a Cold War with China. You know, it's like that kind of thing. Just And, you know, MAGA was a kind of a, a riotous, a disorderly influence, becomes an insurgent threat, a ter- you know, and, a, you know, ubiquitous terrorist threat. It's like everything is like becoming an enemy. And it... You know, it goes back to that the whole uh, network tribalism approach. Um, you know, traditional tribes, you know, you have this positive narrative um, that, you know, explains why you're together and uh, why you're better together in the future and what you've done in the past that has been noble and, and good. And, and um, it, it empowers you, like it uh, brings you together. And uh, the current narratives for these network tribes is all, you know, isn't this enemy evil and we, we should all band together to fight it. And, uh, let's spend all our time talking about that evil, even though we can't agree about what we do, uh, once we won kind of the negative narrative is, is everything now it's dominant. So we can see the effects <laughs> in, in a lot of places now. I mean, you got this perma crisis that that's happening all around us. You know, I don't know what's going to happen in 2024, but it, something bad's coming. Uh, yeah. You look at the with the the you know what what happens in our environment. And one of the things that that struck me in the last couple of weeks is confidence in the in the U.S. military. We all served here um, back in the day. I used to be extremely high. Now we're looking at sixty percent confidence level uh, for uh, the military towards the military. And uh, I mean, there's there's all kinds of other cascading events that are happening as a result of all this. You got you get athletes that are kneeling. Um, this goes back to the narrative, you know. To me, I just spent some time up at Gettysburg with my children, and I saw Barbie in the same Barbie in the same day, right? So right. you know, t- taking them back to the narrative, of our history, and understanding the Civil War a little bit, and then watching Barbie that night, um, I tell you where they gravitated towards, and that was um, the the Gettysburg, right? That that's their best learning. Unfortunately, that's not happening in most of society. You're watching Barbie and learning that we have to hate things about the way we're, we're, we're brought up. So, right. uh, so many things happening in our environment right now, John, I want to know if, if there's anything that, uh, comes to your mind as, as far as, um, uh, some of the outcomes of, of this tribalism. Yeah. You know, um, I, as long as we, uh, see a trend towards, uh, states becoming more, um, powerful and, and, and running alternatives, uh, to the central narrative, I think things are going to be okay. Um, as long as we have escape valves like open source software. I mean, you know, if, if we're in a complex environment, that means that you can't plan solutions centrally. There can't be just one or two solutions that always fail, always. So the best approach is to have lots of experiments underway. And uh, if you had 50 experiments in the United States, each trying different approaches, how do you live and survive and thrive in a, in a complex environment? That's better than just one mandated and that includes values and that includes you know what you think you tell yourself about uh or you know each other about why you're together um you know the military is having problems you know recruitment and the like uh in part because we've uh degraded and and denigrated the one of the core decision-making models for 
you know, our, our, our nation. And that's that tribal model. The traditional tribal decision making model was like the, the first one. It's like part of that, uh, Aquila's, uh, um, Timon network, their tribes, institutions, markets, networks. Each are, you know, major categories of, of social decision making. Tribes was the first. Uh, you know, the earlier ones, you know, decision making systems never go away. So tribes is, you know, it provides you cohesion uh, as a group, uh, even a, even a, a, you know, diverse extended group like a nation, like a 350 million people like we have now. Um, and that uh, it means, you know, if you do it right, if you build this tribal narrative about why you're together and why you're better together and why you're going forward and it's all positive, um, it will mean that when somebody says something, you don't instantly distrust them as an enemy. You'll take what they say as, as potentially as a fact. You might not agree with it, but you're not going to treat it as, as, as poison. And when you destroy that central narrative, everything people who aren't exactly like you are saying uh, uh, is instantly treated as, a, as, a, as an attack, as something to destabilize and weaken you. And they won't even, you won't even, they, they won't even accept your facts because they distrust them at the core. So there's no cohesion. And that means there's no coherence and without coherence, there's no group decision-making and um, it gets worse and worse from there. So going back to that tribal model, we went, we spent the last 20 years, you know, telling kids and, and, and each other that it was a complex system and then it became problematic and then it became, you know, very troubled and 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 uh, evil in many places, and and uh, that did uh, it really wasn't. We didn't progress much, you know, over the two hundred and some odd years that we've uh, been together, and uh, it has an impact. That the founding fathers were all flawed, and they're and they're you know uh, compromised and corrupt and evil. Um, when you do all of that. There's no central narrative to te keep people together, and um, it's replaced by this network tribalism. And the network tribalism is based on, you know, very flimsy foundations. It's just a common enemy. And you ask anyone who's like involved in any of these network tribes, whether anti-racist or anti-fascist or anti-whatever, what their version of justice is, what they're for, no two can agree. They, they know what they hate, but they, they know don't what know they hate. what else that they, 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 they agree on or have cohesion on. Well, what does justice look like? Ask, ask, ask anyone, you know, what is, what is racial justice? What, what is a, a anti-colonial justice look like? And, and, you know, it'll be wild. It'll be all over the map. Uh, you know, money, return of lands, uh, subservience is payback, blah, 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 blah. It, or, you know, at least with the older model, we had the kind of the constitutional written thing where it's like, oh, everyone's equal. And we progressed to make that even more and more equal. Uh, equal at the start, you know, focused on making sure that people had as close to the same opportunity as each other. It, it, and um, it sounds like kind not, of a tribal not focused on making sure that the, the outcomes were equal because that, it removes who, human agency. Uh, yeah, well, uh, we spent, you know, what, 30, 40, 50 years now going, trying to uh, individualize value creation and value formation. And so, you know, uh, that's the reason why most mainstream Protestantism is, is, is almost dead. And uh, it's depopulated the churches and, and it's done so in Europe in a, in a big way. And people are making their own judgments as to what's moral and what's ethical and, and, and the like. And um, that means there's a lot of diversity in, in, in approaches and in, in almost everything. And so uh, you can't ask people what they're for because everyone's formulated it on their own. Now, you know, if you're the right's different than, than the left, it, the left is trying to say, OK, let's just you know, tamp down and ban all the things that we hate. And the right's like, let's just slow down this central thing and, and, and uh, disrupt it. So we can go about our lives at, at, at the periphery, which is, you know, a chaos agent. So we're in this like horrible situation where, you know, we have both sides contributing to the decline of military recruitment and, and you know, future military preparedness. Um, 
at the same time we're, we're ramping up Cold Wars. I mean, even in Ukraine, in this modern environment, they were only able to mobilize, what, uh, 700,000 men. And, you know, the standard, you know, total war metric would be uh, 10%, which would be about two and a half million. Hmm. So, you know, they, they, they're, they're not even able to mobilize a one third of oh. the people that you would typically see in a, in a, in a total war. And they're do much they need more to, unified John, in, the, in this environment, are. do they need to? I mean, we talked about technology and artificial intelligence. Oh, um, yeah. Given well, the, given the context, a, do you need to do that still? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, okay. this is a you know, war of attrition and and because um, it's bogged down and uh, they're burning through bodies. They Their offensive this, this summer burned through their bodies pretty quick um, because they're running against prepared. Remember the Battle of Kursk with the prepared positions the Germans had to punch through? It's just like that. It's terrible, and um, and the Ukrainians. I mean, that that whole situation is pretty interesting because the Ukrainians got a whole bunch of different weapon systems. You know, uh, dr dribs and drabs of all these different advanced weapon systems, and and uh, they went to go train on them and it, and kind of bring them together as a whole, cohesive whole, and it, it, it turned out to be a mess. It's not possible. Uh, it takes a lot, lot more work. Um, a lot more standardization to, to make that possible. So they're they're discoordinated, um, and as a result, they're trying to distract us with attacks with drones on Moscow and, and uh, Crimea, which are destabilizing potentially on the nuclear side. And um, oh, what else have they been doing recently? It's just, but mostly it's just like, hey, we're still making progress. Uh, give us F-16s and you know, like what F-16 is going to save you. It's going to take a couple of years for your pilots to even get up to proficiency using them. Um, it's not going to change the result on the ground in this instance. Yeah. And they're going to be um, pretty conservative in their use because who's going to send a weapon against the kind of air defenses that the Russians could set up? Yeah. What, what so, is the um, way out of this for, in your mind um, in Ukraine? How's, what is the way out? Uh, it's not pretty. I mean, going... The good news is that um, we haven't seen a push into Crimea that would, would have prompted a nuclear use. So if the Ukrainians actually had been more successful and, and pushed into Crimea, um, we probably would have seen nukes. So that's great. Um, given that we've ratcheted up, ratcheted up the hostilities up to the edge of nuclear use, it would probably be in the U.S.'s best interest now that we started a Cold War with China to de-escalate with Russia and uh, I try to drive a wedge between the two, like Kissinger's insight. So we thrown them together, made them dependent on each other, uh, particularly economically through embargo. So uh, we want to uh, add some competition to that kind of co uh, cooperation. Uh, but I, you know, I don't see us being able to cut a deal where the current borders are, you know, as as they look on the ground right now, are um, become the ceasefire line, um, and uh, I don't see us acceding to the fact that uh, Russia will demand that Ukraine is not part of NATO, um, and that they, you know, I, I think if the Russians were going to cut, try to cut a deal, they they probably would try to disarm NATO, uh, Ukraine, because I mean, if they don't, they have this. Even if Ukraine is out of NATO, it's going to have an incredible amount of weapons and drones that will constantly be a threat, like right at the heart of Russia. So, um, yeah, I don't see how, I mean, if you want me to predict how it's going to go, um, probably the Russians will take the country and dismember it. I, I don't think they have any other option from a national security point, uh, point of view. Um, there's no, there's no outcome that we would agree to, um, that doesn't put them into serious danger as, you know, from a, it's like, a it's like if Mexico was armed against us, there's really nothing that we would do to say, you know, we wouldn't let them become a part of a, a Chinese treaty. We wouldn't let them have mm -hmm. any weapons that could danger and put us in danger. There, there we wouldn't, we wouldn't allow to be a lack of empathy we, we'd have to, or putting we'd have ourselves and, in that and, scenario and to try to envision that ever. You know, if 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 the Chinese so, had a, a base in Canada, or if the, you know, if if the Russians and the Chinese had a joint base in in. Uh, you know, Baja California. Yeah, it's not even empathy. It's like, it, it, you know, it's like wars between minds, two minds, and you have to understand what the other mind is thinking. You can't like just go, 
oh, that's just bad thinking or that's evil or that's like something that we're not going to accept kind of thing. Or um, if he if Putin uses nukes, it's, it proves us right that he's he's evil. Right? I go, you don't want to get in that situation. You don't want to like you have to think in terms of what the other guy is thinking. Stop. And what they what's going to, what motivates them, and what what's going to yield you a better outcome at the end of the conflict. You have to think beyond the, the ceasefire or the end of the hostilities, and think about is this stable? Um, is this something that's going to last? I was going to say, I mean, is this beneficial? To uh, Punch and I as recently many were talking possible. on Aaron McLean's School of War podcast, right? I mean, and, and, and uh, G.I. Wilson, who collaborated with Boyd, was actually on our show talking about this. So I wanted to get your take on this. So. A lot of the a lot of the defense movement, a lot of things seem to be let's build this giant Maginot line in the South Pacific. So there's a naval showdown. Sure. We will prevail in a naval showdown because we have the world's best navy and the world's best naval forces and air forces, et cetera. Whereas we we might be looking at this as a chess game or something like that. Whereas the opposite side is playing a different game, maybe Go or something else, where they're going to use they're going to, they're not going to try to confront us in a head to head naval showdown. They're going to use TikTok and they're going to use the news and they're going to use uh, sports. They're going to use uh, drugs. They're going to use everything else except what we think that you know you would do head to head in the South China Sea. What do you, what do you think of that? Oh yeah, I mean that that's typically Chinese strategy. I mean it's how they dealt with the Mongols, right? It's try to you arm one group to have them fight, and so they're not invading you or raiding you on a constant basis. Um, chaos outside the borders is okay. And uh, all the focus is inward and, and inward stability and solving problems and um, getting the resources they need. So as long as they continue to do that unimpeded, they're gonna, it's going to be fine, um, at least from their perspective. Um, yeah, yeah, one thing they do kind of do badly is alliances, right? So navies work best with alliances, and you have to have places to, for your boats to go. You know, and your your ships to go. Your ships have to be able to, you know, stage. Um, and we're better at doing that with Japan and South Korea and and, and Philippines and and uh, and the like. Um, one of the things that I like to think about is the potential for you know autonomous weapons to set up barrages, uh, kind of a mobile uh, maneuver based approach where you just it, infiltrate an area and. You close it off. Like it's not there before you do it. It's like it pops up. It's like like a pop up, a two AD hostile environment for anything that enters. Uh, anything that goes in is dead, kind of thing. Uh, not where humans should go, and um, do that in in a multitude of places, in strategic places, and basically contain an enemy. Uh, and uh, disrupt them in a way, even in their own territory, behind you know, in their mountain ranges, <laughs> in other places. I mean, if you mm-hmm. if you if you infiltrate these drones, uh, you know, autonomous weapons can go slow, and they can go ahead of time, and they can dig in, and they can mm-hmm. self provision, and they can they can last for decades. It's like it's like a mine that's intelligent, but it's mobile, and it's also self refueling, and and um, it can gather information too. Sounds like transformers. Uh, yeah, it's a, kind of. It's like, but it's a uh, very doable. Yeah, and it's not like it has to be cognizant of everything, but it, within the context of what it does, it could be uh, very doable in this environment. And these pop-ups, I mean, Chinese are more likely to be the ones that develop this. So uh, if they go into like the Strait of Strait of Hormuz or 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 um, into some country in Africa and then pop one up. Say you know this is a no go zone for American ships. Yeah, you know uh, what are we going to do? You know, it's, it's, there's no Chinese soldiers necessarily even involved in this. Like they, mm-hmm. they set it up and it just go for so, it. So, and uh, so John, I have to disagree with you on on your way out of uh, the current situation, sure, the current crises, um, and that is the sure. way out of this. The way out of this is through aliens, UAPs, right? <laughs> right. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's that's clearly happening right now. Any thoughts on uh, UAPs? What's going on? How are we in contact, or or what, what what's what's happening in your mind? I mean, it kind of it kind of is a is a good example of the amount of um, chaotic thinking that's going on right now. Um, 
particularly on the left, when they left Twitter, they left their kind of central pattern making apparatus. And now they're, they're even more chaotic and disorganized than they ever were. At least they had something central a couple years ago. Um, UAPs. I don't think it, I mean, I've seen one, but I'm a pilot too. And you guys are, you know, have that kind of experience. I mean, I've seen one, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I think it was an alien. I saw something unusual. Um, and that, uh, that may mean that I just didn't have enough information to process it correctly. Or, you know, if whoever is recording, it didn't have enough information to, to make a conclusion as to what it was. Um, is it likely that we see aliens? Probably not. I mean, mainly because I mean, you've heard of the Fermi paradox. I mean, um, basically, Fermi Fermi said if there's so many aliens, that, you know, so many habitable planets out there, and which would create life, why aren't we seeing aliens? And the the answer is time. You know, I mean, the Earth is what 12 billion years old or whatever, and it you know, it's had multiple attempts at at, at intelligent life. Um, over you know a time period of say you know six or seven or eight billion years for a local area of the universe, and you think of all the habitable planets, maybe it's even millions of habitable planets. Um, intelligent life may emerge in any one of those, and the span of where we're at in terms of technology and sophistication, you know, probably at, at max will be about ten thousand years. Hmm. Okay, so beyond the beyond that level of development. You know, if we go another 8,000 years, we're probably going to be unrecognizable. Just like an ant looking at us. Just see shapes. Mm-hmm. You know, just see just see a foot <laughs> or a you know, big hard thing landing on your head. But the thing is, it's not, it wouldn't be recognizable as something that within its context. So figure all these little 10,000 year blips, bump, bump, bump. Some don't make it, some make it. And try to do it within a, you know, six or seven billion dollar or billion year time frame, unlike we're ever going to bump into anyone. Right. It's just, it, it's just, the probability is way too low. I could probably crunch the numbers on you, but it was like points. Um, you're saying there's a chance though. Well, okay. The dangerous ones, <laughs> no, the, well, the, yeah. the dangerous ones is if something stays at the current level of technology within this 10,000 year thing and it goes sideways, it prioritizes sustainability, it becomes like the two other species on our planet that have survived millions of years, Mm -hmm. ants and termites. Okay. They're adapted to their environment and they don't, they prioritize survivability, but intelligence is a knowledge acquisition is not a survival trait. It's not a survival trait. It's Mm -hmm. a, so you have to wipe that out and you have to wipe out, wipe out compassion because it's too volatile, but on, on and on emotions. So, um, Anything that persists at our level of technology, or you know, better, um, given that it's ships, maybe if traveling interstellar distances, and has lasted millions of years, you don't want to meet them, right? It's it's horrific news. Hmm. So if they found us, and how would they find us? Would they travel ships across the, the gap? Probably not. Probably want to go wormhole, but you can't fit anything big through a wormhole. What you can do is is fit uh, information dense nanotech. So you mm-hmm. slip a piece of nanotech in and it spends got awful amount of time acquiring the resources necessary to build something interesting. And then all you have to do is then bridge it with information. And so, you know, you can use a quantum coupling or whatever, and then you could utilize that planet the way you want it. Um, so if they, what we're seeing is potentially things just popping up that they've built, which would be pretty awful. Regardless, it would be that you know awful outcome kind of situation. So, yeah, what are it, the what are the UAP person. sightings? Yeah, I mean, we you know the Navy uh, F eighteen drivers have seen these things, uh, these little TikTok looking things. Um, yeah, um, or, I've seen lights make right angles in the sky. You mm-hmm. know, I was down in you know Cancun looking out off a veranda, and I saw this thing that looked like a helicopter, and I was like, okay, cool, and it made a right angle, it made a right turn, like uh, ninety degrees. Like instantaneously, it was traveling at a good rate of speed. I was like, what the hell? <laughs> I mean, yeah. So what was it? I don't know. We're in a, we're in a world of uh, UAVs, right? And advanced UAVs and deep, deep um, military programs, UAVs are probably not going to be stuff that we're, we're going to know about until the next big conflict, right? 
Yeah. And so that could be driving a lot of sightings. Um, I mean, a, a lot of the sightings occurred, or it really started taking off in the U.S. after the first nuclear weapon, after, you know, after uh, the first test. Um, then Roswell and that excited it even more. Um, and it's, it aggregated mostly in the U.S. and then it went global. So um, maybe it's just an artifact of the way, the, the rate of change in our technology. Right. Um, we've substituted religious miracles for UAVs or UAPs. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of seeing, you know, miracles and, and, and meaning and, 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 and um, in things, uh, that whole Jungian thing is like you see that meaning and you see that God or you see that the hand of God at work, you're seeing objects and reading meaning into it. So, uh, boy. I don't know. I don't want to be a skeptic on this. I mean, it would be, it, I, but I don't think the outcome would be good if we got found. I like the dark forest approach to development, meaning that in a in a in a big forest, there's lots and lots of predators, and you don't want to be found until until at least you're you're spacefaring, or you know you're up to a point where you can't you can't hide anymore because you're a type two civilization and you've you um, encircled your sun in a your your star in a uh, Dyson sphere, and you're grabbing all the energy off that massive fusion reactor. So that would be visible everywhere, and you can't hide it anymore. Um, but dark forest is good. It's kind of like the way most alternative ways of thinking now um, operate is they use the dark forest approach. They're off the major networks, and they kind of hide in the shadows and think and talk. Um, because John, out, I, I wanted to bring it, it back to Boyd and, and bring it back in a way where, where people we think that, you know, that we work with and speak with and that, that they can tie this sure. together. We, we bring up the words evil and corruption all the time. And a lot of times when people bring it up, it's, a, it's an epithet or it's, it's meant to injure or harm or discredit or something. But I think that Boyd in Strategic Game, his two definitions of those words are, are worth reflecting on because it's observable, I think. Um, and when you think about it this way, um, I think you realize that evil is not necessarily people in a, in a, in a boardroom twirling their mustaches, planning how to you know, poison babies, that um, it could be all around us. So let's start with evil. Boyd says in Strategic Game that evil occurs right. when individuals or groups embrace codes of conduct or standards of behavior for their own personal well-being and social approval yet violate those very same codes or standards to undermine the personal well-being and social approval of others. And then corruption, it says corruption occurs when individuals or groups for their own benefit violate codes of conduct or standards of behavior that they profess or are expected to uphold. The one thing that really catches my attention when, when we're reflecting on Boyd and we're, you know, we're reviewing strategic game, when he says the definition of evil twice, the term social approval. Right. Yeah, well, I, I think it, I think it was tied into um, moral warfare, right? And um, when a group acts in its own self-interest for social approval, being its own self-interest, uh, at the expense of others, um, that co can cause you to lose the moral war. Uh, you know, I always saw you know kind of moral wars as a uh, as gravity. And you track people by being, you know, selfless and, and you know, you, you recognize their needs and, and meet them. But it's all about, you know, shared sacrifice and, 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 and shared goals. Um, but if you act in your own self-interest uh, in a way that harms the people that you're attracting or attempting to attract, then you're going to lose it's kind of an anti-gravity. Yeah, we see. I mean, we see a lot of moral warfare now, mostly because you know, that's the way the left fights. It's through moral warfare. Uh, it was all you know about moral warfare, and the right was about um, maneuver warfare and disruption, you know, at a psychological level. And the the left's moral warfare um, put everything in that context. This is evil. This is good, but uh, not necessarily on the in the in the Boydian constraint. There's a there's a you know a hypo hypocritical kind of element to the Boydian definition. So um, what we see is people saying, okay, I'm in favor of climate. 
reductions. I'm in favor of you know reducing energy use and and uh, saving the planet, but they go travel constantly, you know, and they they uh, are constantly doing things that would keep their homes at 67 degrees, and they uh, you know drive everywhere, they travel everywhere, and they 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 burn energy that would in ways that would be counter to that belief. Yet they're more than willing to say, okay, let's constrain the activities of, of other people to prevent climate change, but not, you know, while they're not doing themselves. Or the same thing like we just saw in Boston yesterday, right? So it's like a group saying, okay, we're in favor of illegal immigration. They get an illegal immigration and then they declare a you know, uh, state of emergency. Because there's 22,000 family or people in, in their shelters in Boston. So it's like they're in favor of this stuff, but they don't necessarily want to live through it or pay the cost of doing it. And they're more than willing to you know, spread the cost to other people that weren't in favor of it in the first place. Um, in many cases, because it's distant and it doesn't impact them. Um, and then the right, you know, it's like, okay. Uh, a lot of people were against. Well, I'm not going to get. It. I'm not going to touch the COVID stuff because that's just crazy. To even mention that kind of thing because people have strong beliefs on that. But um, I, I mean, they're in favor of a, of a strong country, but they are willing to support Trump. I mean, who's? I mean, in some ways, he's in favor of that, but he's he's very destructive of many of the institutions that would make the country strong. Yeah, doesn't it? So, yeah. Well, especially for, you know, it's harder to parse it when it kind of hits it. It makes um, it harder sometimes to, when you're making sense of things. Right. Mm. Yeah. And the the kind of like anti military approach. And granted, Mm -hmm. it's like against the policies of the U.S. military, but it's also impacting recruitment and other things like that. And the desire to equalize, you know, uh, anyway, it, that kind of hypocrisy, that kind of Mm. like, split oh no thing totally is, yeah 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 has an impact that too when you know when we're working or, with that makes sense or is that, even, is that an answer to business your question? Or sports team doesn't matter the way sun Tzu or boyd would divide moral mental physical i think it's very important to understand those uh those concepts um and knowing that say if i'm only focused on the physical and i'm misaligned on the moral I'm going to have I'm going to have adverse consequences as time advances. I'm I'm not going to improve my capacity for free and independent action. Right. Um, and, I, and I feel like when we when we go deep on Boyd and we read destruction creation and we read conceptual spiral and you know, even the strategic game because because as you say you know he was talking about the the moral mental physical levels of warfare. We could cross, I feel I always feel like we could cross out warfare and we could put business. We could put um, anything. Oh yeah. Well, there's a great business example of this. Is I, I wrote a report, like I think last year, about how corporations were aligning, and that that 60 percent of people in developed countries want corporations to take on many of the functions of, of government and go into areas that they're not willing to solve, which is wild. It was based on the Edelman survey, and and um, you know, I pointed out that it would cause friction. You know, when when a corporation starts taking a, a a stand on different issues, they're going to, you know, create political friction with the opposite group. Um, and that, uh, we saw that with Miller Lite or Bill, Bud Light. So Bud Light, I mean, it was one of those brands that it was a top brand. It just minted money, it printed money. It's like you could put an idiot in charge of that and have it just print money year after year after year. It's like cheap beer. Everyone bought it. No one really thought about it. They just did it. It's hard to, it's hard to overstate how valuable that, you know, a couple billion dollar business is. Uh, and then um, somebody got their idea that they wanted some social favor, you know, and, and they were, you know, trying to be a little cooler, a little hip with a, a new set of potential customers, but they were already drinking Bud Light, but they, you know, wanted to increase their bond and gain social approval for uh, demonstrating moral alignment. So they did the, you know, the trans ad campaign. Which then resulted in a political backlash, and then people started leaving the brand because they didn't agree with that new image of the company um, en masse, and that slammed it, and it fell in the rankings, and now it's like a also ran kind of beer. And then uh, the company behind Bud uh, 
tried to reverse course. They said they dumped the ad campaign and uh, tried to go back to their previous, you know, bland alignment. And then they got hit with the other side. So all the gay bars and everything else until they all banned their beer in protest. So they lost even more. I mean, it's just like a good example of how that you know, don't be evil kind of thing is, is you know, can cause uh, uh, because you're they're looking for that social approval, but uh, it's done at the expense of the people that were already supporting. There, there really is a catch twenty two in the sense that uh, there really is a catch twenty two, right? <laughs> and then it set off a chain reaction of how do you destroy your whole brand? Yeah, I mean, it, corporations going political, um, depending on the politics and depending on the alignment they demonstrate, um, has to be done really, really careful. Well, John, we're coming up on an hour. Um, blow yourself up. Pause the uh, for the uh, uh, podcast edition that will roll out, and then we'll head over to some extra content in the uh, in the YouTube channel on AGLX's YouTube channel. But we want to thank you for being the uh, the first repeat guest of No Way Out, and we're glad to be uh, glad to have you in our network. All right. Thanks. Well, thanks for having me on. I, Absolutely. Um, it's always a pleasure talking to you guys. For those listening, uh, and, uh, head over and catch us on the YouTube channel. We'll have a little, uh, some, little watch with, uh, with John Rupp. So thanks for listening to No Way Out. A little, uh, we'll do a little extra content here. Uh, you good on time still, John? Um, just back to evil and corruption, because again, it keeps it keeps coming up on on, on other, yeah, sure. other episodes. And um, we've had a few people encourage, I haven't done it yet, but to, to put a post out on explaining the Boyd definitions again, because they're so crystal clear. They're so applicable to today. You almost wonder, did he foresee? <laughs> Sometimes you, really, you wonder if, if he was foreseeing social media, because a lot of the things, I think you've used the term before, um, field tea, when you know, people would put stuff on, on uh, social media in order to gain social approval. Was that, that was called fealty, correct? Uh, well, no, I use it uh, within the context of terrorism. So it's like, a, it's different than being hired. It's different than joining a group. Uh, it's a decentralized loyalty, meaning that you are an independent operator and you s make yourself subservient to the Lord, to the one, some senior decision maker, uh, some senior group. So um, you're allowed to continue to operate independently, and then you have those you have those ties of loyalty um, that ultimately make you subservient. Weird. It's a but you get their blessing and support, but not if there's nothing really laid out. Filthy is um, yeah. You can you can use filthy within the context of of signaling. And this, you know, a lot of the social stuff we're talking about. So approval, you know, they talk about virtual signaling. That's a, you know, demonstrating fealty. So if you're uh, part of a, um, a network tribe by putting likes on the right posts and saying the right things at the right time, uh, you're demonstrating fealty. Yeah, it seems that. Exactly. Um, yep, you're exactly right. I guess in a lot of respects, you would think that going back to the definition of evil, it, it might be best to stay like for say a company or a business, maybe to stay out of those sorts of sorts of questions or, or issues. Yeah. It, there is a, there is a downside is because of, you know, if customers are demanding it, right. And they won't buy a product or they'll, you know, unless it has that attached or, or talented people won't work at a company because unless they're uh, demonstrated, they're demonstrating this alignment. Um, that's a problem. So um, sometimes there's probably no choice. I mean, I know a lot of talented programmers won't work for different companies because they don't. Which have again the right is kind everybody's of right to do. Correct. Alignment. I mean, you you have, you have the right to do that. So um, in the cut. Right. Oh yeah. Mm. It just adds a, an, yeah, it just adds another layer to the marketplace. Uh, it is possible mm. potentially to, you know, just to stay neutral like a traditional business and kind of on the mm. politics front. And back just to AI. Of, but it's going to oh, be hard. I was going to say back to AI. To I, I saw something uh, just in the last couple of Is days it, how yep. social media influencers are being replaced by AI generated social media influencers. What are your thoughts on that? What are your thoughts on that? I think you may have had something on your Discord server about 
Oh yeah. Well, yeah. You, uh, one of the best ways to, to, uh, generate creative and useful stuff using AI is just to create it and throw it out there. And if people like it, you reinforce it. And that, that I mean, that's kind of Darwinian system. It's like a produce AI influencer content. And if it does well, um, then do more of it or, you know, reinforce it, make it even better and try it out. Um, the feedback loop is, is whether it's good or not, or whether people, people think it's good. Yeah, no, I, I don't doubt that a lot of the, a lot of the uh, personalities we see will be AI only characters that we'll interact with. They'll look in many cases, lifelike, um, They'll, you know, I don't know if you saw. Be interesting and hard to determine whether gonna, they're AI. I was going to say, I don't know if you saw. If you look at my um, most li recent LinkedIn post, from Friday, for current. I, I do one occasion on a yeah. Friday, and I'll say, uh, "Leaders or readers, you know, what are you reading?" Just to get people's insights on books they should be reading or articles, etc. And it's a picture of John F. Kennedy. I've used a couple of them, but it's a picture of John F. Kennedy uh, sitting in different types of chairs in a suit. You know, it, it's all it's all AI. Or the picture, yep. the picture rather, the picture rather is all AI. Right. right? It's oh, not yeah. a. Uh, yeah, um, you know, it's, um, it's not an AI post. It's it's a picture of John F. Kennedy that was created by AI, which I find that John F. Kennedy, if if you put in John F. Kennedy for whatever reason, uh, Mid Journey seems to be really good at producing pictures of John F. Kennedy more realistically than others. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a lot of photos of him. Uh, yeah, I mean, creating lifelike versions of JFK based on his writings and his life that you could well, interact with one. on an ongoing basis. Yeah, you know, well, a buddy, a buddy of mine showed me uh, less on than Sunday. 10 years out. Um, <laughs> And then, and we're, you know, we're it's recording like, this on a, on a Wednesday, yep. but he showed me this just past Sunday that uh, a, a movie trailer, a full on movie trailer with, you know, titles and characters and, right. and cinematic uh, drama and it's completely concocted with AI. Not real. Yeah, no, I, I definitely see people building. And that's why the, they have the writer strike right now in, in uh, Hollywood. Um, is that you'll be able to go from soup to nuts with in building a movie um, just using AI. So like the small indie production will be, you know, a, a writer, a director who, you know, writes with the aid of AI and then uses that language to create scenes and then tweaks them and creates video segments and, and ends up creating it's, you know, a small independent production with unique characters and um, unique scenes, and, and it, it's complete. I mean, you could go on for hours and potentially then take that whole thing and with a couple more tweaks, turn it into a game. <laughs> like it's immersive. So it's like, wow. Yeah, I mean, I mean would you, you know, even hire a graphic designer of a creative anymore? individual you can, you in the not too distant future and have a logo amazing. in two seconds? Well, acceptable, but okay, then the um, standards go up, right? And then the quality that people demand is going to increase. And so what, you, what you'll end up doing with designers is they'll leverage themselves using uh, image and video based AIs to uh, produce even more elaborate and more um, detailed and, and, and better. And they can create, I mean, uh, there's certain things that you can get out of the AI, but you can also uh, push it to when, develop or explore different themes and different, you know, styles. When you see you it, when you look across the, the, so you know, I, you the know, various I just see industries, so I don't um, see it as a replacement for a designer. You know, Buckminster Fuller wrote that in the future, all specialists will be replaced by automation. And I, I wonder if, when you think of a guy like John Boyd, for example, who was a radical generalist that pulled from every discipline, is the is the generalist likely to thrive going forward and be more resilient than the specialist who may be more subject to artificial intelligence or automation than the than the generalist? What do you think on that? Um, I. Uh... It, it, it is kind of tough is that I think that everything that we do will eventually find its way into some level of automation. So, um, you know, capture the world, basically capture everything that we do in this world and, 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 and find a way to preserve it in its entirety in a, in a neural network. And, uh, that will only push us to find new, new things that we can do so we can preserve it in AI. Um, interesting thing is, is that, uh, this is self-referential, this AI, right? Uh, it's, 
the, ter- the determination of what is good that's coming out of it is up to us. We're the ones that you know say this is good output and this is useful uses or useful applications and, and the like. If we come up with new stuff uh, that we find useful, or, you know, we're going to use this AI to capture it and, and, and or make it possible. I don't know. And it, it, there is a creative burden that will hit. I, it may not be that uh, uh-huh. beneficial to have a lot of people, you know, like big, big, big populations like it used to be in the past. Cognitive, the cognitive load that you have to have in order to operate in this environment is pretty high. Uh, but you know what? What might happen is if you if you give tutors, you know, AI tutors to every person in Asia, right? Mm. It, that from a young age, and there's something visual that they can see and, and interact with, and it teaches them about everything all the time, guides them, provides them values and outlook, mediates for them if somebody else is harassing them mm. or whatever. Um, what is the you know potential output of a population that's raised that way? So, so it would be something like, like along the lines of and you know, they're people native to knowing that don't how to understand use, or use the tool. Replaced by AI, but people that understand um, AI can work with AI will replace people that that don't. Is that is that maybe more along the lines? Of, yeah. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, you'll do more and and better things. That's why I was always kind of focused on trying to find, make sure that we still have an outlet to keep on going up because I, I'd rather not have all that, you know, creative focus and, and drive focused inward, you know, trying to root out faults and inward battles. I'd like to see us get out of this gravity. So, so as we drive it home, here, I guess the, um, use all this the thing I would tell everybody that's to, listening or, you know, watching us on YouTube, expand. uh, to take full advantage of dialing into your network on your global gorillas report, which is now on, on Substack, um, I think with a paid subscription, you get access to the discord server, which I find more informative than, uh, any, any news outlet that I, uh, that I can find. And we would direct people there. Um, I would also, we, we said it on the first episode with you, um, brave new war is a book that everybody yeah. needs to read because we were talking about patterns that haven't changed much, even though the media might've changed. I guess that kind of begs the question is, have you thought of a revision or an update of that book or a, maybe a, you know, a, a continuum to that book, just given everything that we've seen since uh, 2000? Yeah, it's, uh, it's hard to, to write anything that's solid like a book in this changing environment. And I know I would benefit from it and it would be great if I did it. And um, I don't know. I mean, it, it was really hard to write that first one. I mean, holding an entire book in your head like so it runs it's smooth throughout and everything connects and it was was a right. real chore i know some people can just throw out a bunch of different chapters and kind of stitch them together lightly but i tried to make it all one cohesive story and uh and it was kind of painful but um maybe i'll do it i mean i there's plenty of things that could happen i mean in terms of ai and in terms of social social governance globalization versus localization all that stuff is would be cool uh, to write up what, uh, within the context of warfare. Maybe, uh, and, and maybe close with this. What are things that you're life. reading regularly or, or, or books that you've come across lately that uh, we'll you would see. recommend to others that <laughs> are you know, trying to uh, you know, ma- maintain their ability to thrive in disruption and be resilient? Oh, wow. Um, I think most of the resilient stuff that people have, uh, used to rely on uh, is kind of outdated with the kind of social environment we live in now um, because a lot of the resilience is focused on, on just surviving the kind of social pressures um i mean making your household resilient and against disruptions is pretty straightforward um but making your life resilient against uh social disruption and social manipulation is harder uh getting in a, you know unadulterated information flows is harder how about so, uh, some stacks or, or I haven't really more, seen much in terms of uh, more, as you books say, the technology has changed that. so much that maybe a physical book, but something, um, you know, living and breathing like your Discord server. I mean, that's a participatory environment where people can come together and learn and, and, and teach, teach each other. Yeah, I mean, it, a wide information diet, you know, where you're looking at a lot of different things, trying to get both sides of the, the conflict, like both types of networks. Um, so you can see how they see each other, which is always awesome. Um, give you a heads up on the kind of language and, and the structure of the conflicts coming forward or going forward. 
spend time playing. You know, I spend time playing with AIs. Just playing with them. I mean, I got a stability AI running on my, which is an image AI running on my desktop. Uh, if you have a beefy PC, you can do that. Uh, you know, running the tools and seeing how they work. Uh, yeah. You know, and it gives you a feel for how they operate. And if you can get a feel for a technology, then you start thinking, it gives you a, a, a kind of an insight that, that you know, fingertip feel for how it's going to roll out, how you can use it to amplify or leverage yourself. But you got to play. Mm. Uh, I play games too, and, and games are great too. I was doing a, the, like the modded Skyrim and just modding, 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 modding. And how it went from this like kind of clunky game, which is a good core game, but through modifications it becomes like a, you know, a tactile environment. It's like really amazing. And all the different types of approaches that people use to mod, mod this or that, faces expressing emotion, dialogue using uh, AI voice synthesis and uh, AI dialogue being folded in. Um, it gives you a real good sense of what AR will feel like ahead of time. Um, and the kind of you know, rapidity of change that's possible. Yeah. How you modify that environment. Uh, so that's playing again. Um, for the most part, it's just, you know, spend time dipping into different history. Well, you books. always you bring up Marshall McLuhan you know, in my, a lot. In my in library to find out. Uh, that people have never heard of Marshall McLuhan. Try, kind of um, try you should look into him and compare it. Because I have... Um, um, on your, on your uh, sort of advice, so to speak, when I read something you'd written years ago, I, I wound up getting um, all oh, of wow. Kuhn's books and really trying to dig into them, and, and uh, you know, very, very similar insights to to what's going on. Yeah, no, I I, I, I like his uh, his views on warfare and the like. It were were really useful. A lot of his later stuff, um, you know, hot and cold media and stuff like that. I just kind of like thought, I mean, that's just. He's reaching at this point, and people spend a lot of time mm. talking about the kind of the weak stuff. I, I really like the the way he uh, got a feel for how technology is rewiring us and the impact of that. Um, and if you can get suss that out of his books, and his books are really lightweight read, um, yeah, it's good. I and mean, you know, just get a feel for how he how he thinks, and 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 it's a surprising number of insights into what we're experiencing now. We will, if we're going to survive this age of the global village where everyone is um, nosy and uh, vicious and um, always trying to kind of dominate each other inside this kind of environment where everybody's just, a, you know, sharing their thoughts and they're right in front of you on your, you know, the tip of your nose on your phone. Um, we'll have yeah. to build a social artifact that mediates that. And a social artifact means a technology artifact. Technology gives mm -hmm. some structure to our environment that mm -hmm. in, in a way that prevents us from, right. You know, like all the po old pogroms and, and, and the like all occurred in those little we'll villages. We'll cancel you. Blood, we'll, we'll kick which you trials, off the platforms. You know? We're going to like, debank oh, you. You know, you don't conform. Uh, yeah. You're banished or you're dead. We'll hack you, hack you to death at night and burn down your house. Well, and it goes back stuff. to Boyd saying that it's a game of interaction isolation. A lot of, uh, right. a lot of the interacting amongst tribes is yeah, to isolate. Yeah. Cause it's like, you know, it has that kind of tribal mentality. Real, imagine, not us, and then discredit the human. Uh, defame so, them, uh, delegitimize them to the point where they can't, they don't have the capacity for free and independent action anymore. Yeah. Or we are, we ourselves are us, right? Like we, right. Right. And it, you mean the classical mm -hmm. name that most tribes had for themselves is always people, the people, everyone else wasn't the people. Oh, yeah. And they're not us, mm -hmm. they're enemies. And even, you know, when barter was only developed as a, economic vehicle was uh, exchange among enemies. Yeah. It was like an arm's length transaction done between enemies. Not like a, a friendly on that thing. Point, I mean, you know, again, these You're assuming the patterns the of conflict goes back all the way to recorded history to find every example so, uh, of warfare. Yeah, it's, it's rough stuff did. in the I mean, past. It just seems past, that the, the means know, change, a lot the, of or the medium and the means change, but the, the, but the patterns don't really change that much. Yeah, some of the patterns don't change. Uh, uh, some parts of the pattern are emphasized or de-emphasized. In terms of warfare, yeah, Boyd was right on. And in terms of, uh, you know, social decision-making systems, I like the Archela stuff, the Tinman network, or tribes, institutions, markets, networks. That seems to work. It's a good, 
it's a good paper to read. If you want to read it, and they, all this, you know, all the stuff he wrote on that. I think we could go on for I hours. We'll pause network. here, and then we'll do uh, on, on the hat trick of your return um, to uh, to No Way Out. So we'll keep the uh, we'll keep the dialogue open. Yeah. We'll make sure that we're linked to uh, Global Gorillas. Uh, make sure people have not, if they've not read Brave New War yet they should and even though it's hard to believe right it's coming up on 20, 20 years since you since you wrote that um, the, there's still a lot of validity in the in the patterns and thinking that one needs to apply as they encounter their world well yeah. hey we'd love to we'd love to collaborate I mean that's the whole the whole point of of, of uh, No Way Out is to is to keep developing and yep. uh, advancing these ideas yeah, that Boyd was so so prescient on right but um, um, you know, as, as complexity sciences and other things become more and more understood, and realizing that the requirement to understand, uh, you know, complexity, um, no matter how they define it, whether it's VUCA or other acronyms, um, that the the time is now, and the orientation being so so critical. I mean, again, I'm I'm biased because I've been consuming your work from from what seems the very beginning when you emerged on the the scene back around the great financial crisis. Um, you're you're constantly trying to show others that they have to maintain an orientation that's aligned to reality as circumstances unfold and they have to be able to, to create and destroy models fast. They have to let go of things that are uh, no longer true or valid fast enough so that they can adapt. They can learn and adapt in order to thrive. So awesome. Well, we'll, we'll hit, uh, I'm going to hit the stop on the recording. Thanks again. And